from downtown Decatur, it's the Faber Files. Hello, I'm your host, Bill Faber. Because democracy demands debate, we present this program, a program on public access TV to cover issues and interests of our Decatur community. Tonight, part two of the play, Reflections on the Life of Clarence Darrow. As you know, Clarence Darrow is probably the most famous lawyer in American history. And tonight we see the highlight and the dramatic apex of Clarence Darrow's legal career as he defends some of the most famous criminals in American annals of history. I hope you enjoy part two of this very exciting play. Thanks for watching. Darrow, however, had a huge problem in the case. The evidence of his client's guilt was simply overwhelming. It was not only based on credible eyewitness testimony, but on documentary evidence that showed the McNamara brothers had been dynamiting job sites for years in their efforts on behalf of unions. Darrow was faced with a dilemma. Proceed to trial or and quite likely lose the case and see one or both of his clients executed, or negotiate a plea deal that might save the life of his clients and would possibly get at least one released from jail during his lifetime. If he went to trial, even if he lost, labor might be able to save face and deny the guilt of the men, and labor would continue to respect Darrow's efforts on its behalf. But if he pled the McNamara's guilty, labor would never forgive him. Darrow was a realist and a great, great opponent of capital punishment. He was aware of his duties to his clients, that trumped social considerations and matters of his own popularity. He convinced the men to plead guilty, John, Jim McNamara to the Times bombing and JJ to another non-fatal bombing. In doing so, he certainly must have saved their lives to the predictable disillusionment and anger of union members across the country. Now, there was one other factor which might have entered into Darrow's thinking. The government had found out early on that a member of the defense team of investigators, in an effort to secure not guilty votes for jurors in the events of trial, had bribed a juror. And then there was a second bribe that occurred later. The thinking was, it seems, that even in light of a strong prosecution case, at least a hung jury might be obtained uh, on behalf of the defendants. Incredibly, when the police arrested the defense investigator doing the bribing, one Bert Franklin, uh, just as he was giving the money to one of the jurors, Clarence Darrow was in the immediate vicinity, kitty corner across the street, if I recall correctly. The guilty pleas of the McNamara's went on to take place, but Darrow, Darrow's real problem and bigger problem wasn't just the fallout from that. Rather, he found himself a defendant in the case of the people of the state of California versus Clarence Darrow. Now, we don't have time to go into the specifics of the facts of the case. There was no question that the men had been bribed. The question was whether Darrow had authorized it. He assisted in his defense and rose to give a closing argument on his own behalf. Gentlemen of the jury, it is not easy to argue a case of importance even when you are talking about someone else. And, uh, I might not argue this case as well as I would some other case. But I felt out to say something to you 12 men besides what I said on the witness stand. In the first place, I have a defendant charged with a serious crime. In the next place, I am a stranger to you, 2,000 miles away and friends. I am unknown to you. In all my life, I never saw or heard so sneaky and brutal a case as this thing against me. What am I on trial for? You have been sitting here for three months. If you don't know, then you are not as intelligent as I believe. I am not on trial for seeking to bribe a man named Lockwood. There may be, in Dallas are many people who think I did seek to bribe him, but I am not on trial for that. I am on trial.
because I have been a lover of the poor, a friend of the oppressed, because I have stood by labor for all these years and brought down upon my head the wrath of the criminal interest in this country. Whether guilty or innocent of the crime charged in the indictment, this is the reason I am here. This is the reason I have been pursued by as cruel a gang as ever followed a man. I am in your hands, not theirs, just yet. They would stop my voice with the penitentiary. Oh, you wild members of the Steel Trust and Erectors Association. Oh, you mad hounds of detectives who are willing to do your master's will. Oh, you district attorneys. You know not what you do. Don't you know that upon my persecution and destruction would arise 10,000 men more able, more devoted, and ready to give more than I have given in support of a righteous cause. Yes, I have been, perhaps, interested in more cases for the weak and the poor than any lawyer in America. But I am pretty nearly done anyway. Darrow continued, his second wife Ruby by his side at much of the trial, occasionally offering him a handkerchief. He didn't spend much time in argument denying his guilt, but rather he seemed to allow the jurors to assume his guilt and ask them to acquit him nonetheless. Gentlemen, I have been human. I have done both good and evil. But I hope that when the last reckoning is made, the good will overbalance the evil. And if it does, then I will have done well. I hope it will so overbalance it that you jurors will believe it is not to the interest of the state to have me spend the rest of my life in prison. Finally, on the second day, Darrow concluded, if you should convict me, there are many people who will applaud the act. But if in your judgment, in your wisdom, in your humanity, you believe me innocent and return of not guilty in this case, I know that from thousands and tens of thousands and, yea, perhaps millions of the weak and the poor throughout the world will come thanks to this jury for saving my liberty and my name. It worked. Perhaps the jury believed that the 55-year-old Darrow, when he said he was pretty nearly done with his slouching posture and his worn, lined face, was ill and, and retired, and, uh, if not dying, he was acquitted. The bloom came off the rose of his initial acquittal when he was tried again uh, for the bribe of the second juror and did not get an acquittal, but rather the result was a clearly divided hung jury. In order to avoid yet another trial, he had to give up his license to practice law in California, which is no small loss to a lawyer. To an Many, many of his contemporaries, regardless of the result of the California trials, thought that he had indeed been guilty of bribing the jurors. What do I think? I, like many at the time, and many who study the matter today, think that he was guilty of authorizing the bribes. I think he was guilty of this felony. That's right, I think Clarence Darrow, regarded by many as the greatest lawyer in American history, was a felon was a cheat, showed disregard for the legal system he was privileged to practice in, disregard for the legal system he made his living practicing in, and used as a, a platform for his views and a springboard for his celebrity. I base this on a number of factors. The first, that he didn't very strenuously deny his actual guilt, either in court or out of court. It would seem to me highly unlikely the lead investigator would be spending thousands of dollars in a a cash-strapped defense without the lead attorney, Darrow, knowing about it, it's asking perhaps too much to put down to coincidence that he happened to be in the uh, vicinity of the crowded intersection just as money was illegally being passed. But perhaps more important was the radical nature of Darrow's personality, the village infidel nature of his father, but perhaps to a greater degree and on a much greater stage. Darrow saw himself 
having worked for government and big business, knowing that capital and labor were on such equal footing, Darrell saw himself, I think, as a soldier, uh, and even a general, in what I said before was, to him, another civil war. And he was a great admirer of people like John Brown, a radical who uh, was violent efforts to incite a slave uh, uprising uh, came right on the eve of the Civil War. Darrow had an ends justify the means mentality that I believe him, that I believe led him to violate the law to secure a favorable result in what he considered an important battle in the war. And ultimately, and I think the lawyers in the audience here will recognize this, what occurred with the jurors who acquitted and refused to convict Clarence Darrow was something called jury nullification. Jury nullification goes back to at least 17th century England. It was occasionally invoked in the Revolutionary War times by local juries who refused to, co uh, to convict people on, on trial at the hands of the Crown. It has been invoked in prohibition cases in the 1920s and in uh, many cases in the 1960s and 70s involving draft dodging and things like that. In essence, what jury nullification involves is a jury resorting to and employing its own sense of justice and the juror's collective conscience to come to a verdict at odds with the instruction to the facts. A jury refuses to convict even when the evidence shows the defendant to be guilty for what the jury considers a more important consideration. This is what I would say to Clarence Darrow, who often either openly or subtly asked the jurors to uh, use jury nullification or to come to uh, what might be called situation justice. While he was spared a felony conviction in a prison sentence, he went back to Chicago in many ways a broken man. He was near broke financially, and, uh, since he'd expended much of his savings defending himself, Upon his return, his reputation was tarnished. He was no longer entrusted with labor or other large cases. But amazingly, his greatest accomplishments still lay before him. It was F. Scott Fitzgerald who wrote, There are no second acts in American life. Clarence Darrow was the early exception to this rule. Upon his return to Chicago, he really did have to start over. He had to sell some valued possessions to get out of debt. He had to take on more speaking engagements to earn money. He formed a new law partnership, and no longer getting uh, labor cases, he began to take more and more criminal cases. Now, Darrow's views on criminal law were quite consistent with the views he often put forth in the labor cases. In the labor cases, he often cautioned the jurors not to blame the occasionally violent or illegally acting defendants any more than one blames the lightning for the thunderstorm. These things were bound to occur. In criminal cases, he had a tendency with which I personally don't entirely agree to sometimes seem to excuse moral culpability on the theory that hereditary and environment shaped individuals and in how they acted and caused and explained, if did not excuse, certain illegal behavior. But I can tell you this, Clarence Darrow was decades, decades ahead of his time in seeking to understand the causes of crime and how we might treat uh, criminals in, in once they are convicted. Darrow repeatedly debated and lectured on topics such as whether there was a God or an afterlife, indeed, whether life was worth living, taking the negative or agnostic position on such questions. He struck even friends and admirers, uh, particularly following the trials in California, as extremely cynical. He decried, there is no such thing as justice in or out of court. He opined, society cannot be saved. It isn't worth saving anyhow. Lincoln Steffens, a journalist who later befriended the attorney, spoke of an early encounter with him. Steffens related a time when he went to Darrow's law office to interview him. And the latter seemed to be trying to recall where he had met Steffens, taking his car, examining him. And suddenly, Roaring back his, uh, roaring with laughter. Oh, I remember. You are the man that believes in honesty. <laughs> Stefan was later recalled. Darrow laughed and laughed. He took and shook my hands. But he did not invite me into his office, and he did not answer my questions. 
They only amused him the more. And I, well, I ran away. Darrell always wanted to be a man of letters, and he dreamed of being able to give up the practice of law entirely to pursue literary interests. And he did engage in a fair amount of non-legal writing and publishing. In addition to his many essays, his works include an autobiography written later in life, which contained far more of his philosophy than facts, and also a largely autobiographical and highly sentimental novel about childhood and numerous short stories. One entitled Little Louis Epstein I Read. It's the tale of a poor nine-year-old Jewish boy on Maxwell Street in Chicago selling papers so that his mother could have a Christmas present. Now, Lewis had already lost one of his uh, hands in childhood due to an accident and is out there in the frigid cold selling these papers for his mother because they don't have any money. But unlike the other boys, since he only has one hand, he can't alternate his hands in his pocket and he winds up getting severe frostbite and losing the other hand. It was the most depressing Christmas story I think I've ever read. Uh, Darrow's fiction is laced with heavy nostalgia and social commentary, and uh, I don't think that the writers within the audience would uh, be too impressed by his work. Let's just say Charles Dickens, he wasn't. But lazy, he wasn't either. He clawed his way back in the years following his return from California. He represented African-American Isaac Bond, who was charged with the rape and murder of a white nurse for the reason that he felt strongly that identification testimony, particularly in the case of African Americans, is highly suspect. I can tell you as a lawyer who's done a little bit of criminal law in my time that uh, I should have concern with Darrow. Uh, he represented the city's first African American uh, alderman and its chief of police on corruption charges, got them both acquitted. While there's an image of Darrow as representing the underdog, he often represented the overdog, too. His clients came to include corporations, not only politicians, but mobsters, and on a couple of occasions, women in cases that I swear to God could be lifted right out of the musical Chicago. In, in one case, for God's sakes, uh, his client, Emma something or other, walked into a courtroom and shot her husband to death four times during their divorce proceedings was tried and Darrell got her off on temporary insanity. She was back out on the cocktail circuit in 30 days. Uh, there was an old saying in Cook County, you can't convict a, a pretty woman of uh, murder one, and, uh, or whatever they called it back then. And that seems to have been the case. His reputation among non-liberals improved dramatically when he was supportive of the United States entry into World War I. He, de he declared, when you are partisan, you have at least one chance in two of being right. If you are neutral, you have no chance to be right. He represented a world-renowned architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright had an interest in beautiful women, which, uh, by the way, Darrow shared. Uh, neither man was faithful in their marriages. And Darrow, at one point in time, became something of an advocate for free love. Uh, when the architect was charged with violating the Mann Act for crossing state lines with a woman for presumably immoral purposes, Darrow worked behind the scenes and convinced the district attorney to drop the charges. His rhetoric in defending clients could be stirring and evocative of great speeches in American history. I shall not argue to you whether the defendant's ideas are right or wrong. I am not bound to believe them right in order to take this case, and you are not bound to believe them right in order to find them not guilty. I don't know whether they are right or wrong. But I do know this. I know that the humblest and the meanest man who lives, I know that the silliest and idlest man who lives, ought to speak his mind. I know he ought to have his say. And I know the Constitution is a delusion and a snare. If the humblest and the weakest man in the land cannot be defended in his right to think and his right to speak as much as the greatest and the strongest in the land, I am not here to defend their opinions. I am here to defend their right to express their opinions. In another case, he showed a great, great ability for hyperbole, such as arguing, if Fred Lund or any man in this case could be convicted on this evidence made up of 
suspicions and cobwebs, then I want to retire to a cannibal island and be safe. In his second marriage, he moved to the area near the, near the University of Chicago in Hyde Park in Chicago, and it just happened that this was the area that was the backdrop to his next great trial. And if you want to hear about the Leopold and Lowe case and other great cases of Darrow's career, you'll have to hang around until after I take a 10 minute break. Uh, I encourage you to look at some of the pictures of some of the uh, individuals in Darrow's life and order yourself uh, something to drink if you like. I'll be back. I've often thought of what might have been if 
life would have been fair to him. Far least he might have had his socialist newspaper. Like so many thousands before him, he trod a dark road to do. Both a better education, a better environment, he might have traveled the straight path, the majority, to a flower-covered grave in a churchyard instead of under a later gravel potter field. The Roaring Twenties. Bootleggers bootlegging, clappers clapping, Tommy guns tommying. Young people with entirely too much time on their hands, frightening their parents and society at large with their seeming immorality. On the afternoon of May 21st, 1924, Nathan, known to his friends as Babe Leopold, and Richard, known to his, known to his friends as Dickie Lowe, enticed 14-year-old Bobby Franks into a rented car, clubbed him and choked him to death, stripped the body and rubbed a chemical on his face and genitals, thinking that this would make identification more difficult, and disposed of the body in a culvert in a nature preserve. Leopold and Loeb were just 19 and 18 years old at the time. They were graduate students who were considered extremely intelligent and were the sons of wealthy, respected Chicago family. The killing of Bobby Franks was done, it seems, out of a warped pseudo-sexual relationship between the two, and for no real reason other than for the challenge of committing the perfect crime. The press, the press latched on to the face of uh, the case for me with fascination as Leopold and Lowe became the poster boys for the new generation of young people with far too much time on their hands. Well, for two such intelligent young men, it was a very imperfect crime. They didn't do a very good job of disposing the body or rendering it difficult to identify. It was found and identified within a day. They dropped Leopold's glasses and left them to be discovered at the scene. While the prescription for the lenses was not at all uncommon, the tortoise shell frames were very unique, and there were only three such prescriptions for such frames in the entire city of Chicago, so the police had no problem identifying them and finding them for questioning. They were seen cleaning the car of suspicious stains. They merely threw the chisel, which had been used as a glove tape, and held backwards.